Hello, and welcome to Chapter 5 Medical Terminology Lecture. After you complete this chapter and the related coursework, you will be able to use foundational and anatomical medical terms and abbreviations in written and oral communication with colleagues and other healthcare professionals. You will understand the purpose of medical terminology, be able to identify its components, and be able to define an unknown medical term based on the dis dissection and understanding of its components. You will also be able to identify error-prone medical abbreviations and acronyms. Common direction, movement, and positional terms are also presented in this chapter. Okay, so let's get started. As an EMT, you must have a strong working knowledge of medical terminology. For effective communication and documentation, you must understand key terms, acronyms, symbols, and abbreviations. You can determine the meaning of an unknown word by understanding how terms are formed, also learning the definitions for parts of medical terms. Understanding medical jargon will help you communicate effectively with other members of the EMS, healthcare, and public safety teams. So, let's talk about the anatomy of a medical term. Medical terms are made of distinct parts that perform specific functions. Changing or deleting any of those parts can significantly change the function or meaning of the word. So, components that comprise medical terms include the word root, and that's the foundation of the word, the prefix, and that's what occurs before the word root, the suffix, that's what occurs after the word root, and combining valves. These are valves that join one or more word roots to other components of a term. How the parts of the term are combined determines its meaning. So accurate spelling is essential in medical terminology. The suffix, Phasia means speaking, whereas phagia means eating or swallowing. The prefix dis means difficult or painful. So dysphagia means difficulty speaking, where dysphagia means difficulty eating or swallowing. The terms ilium and ilium are pronounced exactly the same, but refer to different anatomical parts. Knowing anatomy and the context of these words are used to help you correctly determine and spell the term in a given situation. So let's talk about word roots. The main part or stem of the word is called the word root or root word. It conveys the essential meaning of the word and frequently indicates a body part. Most terms have at least one word root, and some have more than one root. Adding a prefix or suffix to the word root creates a term. Changing the prefix or suffix will change the meaning of the term. So cardiopulmonary breaks down as the following. Cardio is the word root meaning heart, and pulmon is the word root meaning lungs. By performing CPR, you introduce air into the lungs and circulate the blood by compressing the heart. Some word roots may also be used as prefixes or suffixes for other terms. So prefixes. A prefix is the part of a term that appears at the beginning of the word. Prefixes usually describe location or intensity. Prefixes are found in general language such as autopilot or submarine or tricycle, as well as in medical and scientific terminology. So not all medical terms have prefixes though. A prefix gives the word root its specific meaning. For the word root pia, one can add a prefix, a, and that means without, or brady, that means slow, or tacky means rapid, to create three different terms. So by learning the commonly used medical prefixes, you can figure out the meaning of the terms that may not be immediately familiar to you. 
and suffixes. Suffixes are placed at the end of the words. So suffixes usually indicate a procedure, condition, disease, or part of a speech. A commonly used suffix is itis, which means inflammation. So when paired with a word root athro, meaning joint, the resulting word is arthritis, an inflammation of the joint. And then there's combining vowels. So a combining valve is the part of a term that connects a word root to a suffix or another word root. In most cases, it is an O. However, it may also be an I or an E. Okay, so let's look at an example of these combining vowels. So gastro, entro, ology. So stomach plus intestines plus the stomach, the study of. The combining vowel helps ease the pronunciation of the term. A combining form is a combining vowel shown with the word root. Some common combining forms are cardio, which is heart, gastro is stomach, hepto is liver, arthro is joint, osteo is bone, and pulmono is lungs. So word building rules. When building or taking apart a medical term, it is helpful to understand some basic rules. The following summarizes the rules covered thus far. So a prefix is always at the beginning of the term. However, not all terms will have a prefix. And the suffix is always at the end of the term. Use a combining vowel when a suffix begins with a consonant and the term has more than one word root, a combining vowel must be placed between the two word roots, even if the second word root begins with a vowel. So next we're gonna talk about plural endings. To change a term from singular to plural form, certain rules apply. Sometimes you can simply add an S. So lung becomes lungs, but some rules are more complicated. Rules you may encounter when converting from a singular to a plural terms are singular words that end in an A change to an AE when plural. Example, vertebra becomes vertebrae. Singular words that end in an IS change to an ES when plural. Example, diagnosis becomes diagnoses. Singular words that end in an EX or IX change to an ICES. Example is apex becomes apices. Singular words that end in an om or um change to an a. And that's uh, an example is ganglion becomes ganglia or ovum becomes ova. And then finally, singular words that end in us change to an i. So an example is bronchias becomes bronchii. So then there are some special word parts. Prefixes can be used to indicate numbers, colors, positions, and directions. Numbers, so several prefixes are used to indicate if a term involves a number, such as half, one, or two, or more parts or size. Some examples are uni, diply, non, primi, multi, and bi. And then there's colors. So several word roots are used to describe colors, such as sino, leuco, urethro, syro, or melina. Positions or directions. So prefixes can also be used to describe position, direction, or location. So some examples of these are ab, ad, d, circum, peri, trans, epi, and supra. And then you have directional terms. So you need to know the correct directional terms to discuss where the injury is located or how pain radiates in the body. Some directional terms include right and left, superior and inferior, lateral and medial, proximal and distal also superficial and deep, ventral and dorsal, palmar and plantar, and apex. 
The terms right and left refer to the patient's right and left sides, not your right and left sides. So superior and inferior. The superior part of a body part is the portion nearer to the head from the specific reference point. The part nearer to the feet is the inferior, inferior portion. These terms are also used to describe the relationship of one structure to another. So for example, the knee is superior to the foot and inferior to the pelvis. Lateral and medial. So parts of the body that lie further from the midline are called lateral or outer structures. In general terms, lateral means side. The parts that lie closer to the midline are called medial or inner structures. So for example, a patient has a five centimeter laceration on the medial aspect of the thigh. That means towards the inside. Then you have proximal and distal. The terms proximal and distal are used to describe the relationship of any two structures on an extremity. Proximal describes structures that are closer to the trunk. Distal describes structures that are farther from the trunk or nearer to the free end of the extremity. So for example, the elbow is distal to the shoulder and proximal to the wrist and hand. Then you have superficial and deep. So superficial means closer to or on the skin, and deep means further inside the body or tissue and away from the skin. So for example, a superficial burn involves only the top layer of the skin, similar to a sunburn, whereas a deep laceration involves a cut deeper into the tissue, such as with a knife. Then you have ventral and dorsal. So ventral refers to the belly side of the body, or the anterior surface of the body. Dorsal refers to the spinal side of the body or posterior surface of the body. So think of a dorsal fin of a dolphin, which is on its back. The more commonly used terms are anterior, and that's the front surface of the body, and posterior, that's the back surface of the body. Then you have palmer and planter. So the front region of the hand is referred to as the palm or palmer surface, and the bottom of the foot is referred to as the plantar surface. The apex is the tip of the structure. For example, the apex of the heart is the bottom or inferior portion of the ventricles in the left side of the chest. Next, we're gonna talk about movement terms. So the following terms relate to the movement. Flexation is the bending of a joint. Extension is the straightening of a joint. Adduction is the motion towards the midline. You add it. And abduction is the motion away from the midline. So you have some other directional terms. A body part that appears on both sides of the midline is thought of as bilateral. So for example, Eyes, ears, hands, and feet are bilateral. And structures inside the body also appear on both sides of the midline. So for examples are lungs and kidneys. Also something that appears on only one side of the body is said to be unilateral. So for example, unilateral chest expansion means that only one is expanding with inhalation. And that could be a pneumothorax. As an EMT, you should be able to describe the exact location of areas of the abdomen. The abdomen or abdominal cavity is divided into four equal quadrants, the right upper quadrant, the left upper quadrant, the right lower quadrant, and then the left lower quadrant. Again, right and left refers to the patient's right and left, not yours. It's important to learn all of these terms and concepts so you can describe the location of any injury or assessment findings. Use the terms properly so that any other medical personnel who care for the patient will know immediately where to look and what to expect. Anatomic position. So there are many terms to describe the position of the patient on arrival or during transport to the emergency department prone or supine, 
Fowler's position. And the body is in the prone position when it's laying face down. And the body's in the supine position when it's laying face up. The Fowler position is semi-reclining position with the head elevated to help the patient breathe easier and to control the airway. A patient who is sitting upright is said to be in the Fowler position. Semi-Fowler position is when the patient sits with the back of the stretcher at a 45 degree angle. And then the high Fowler position is when the patient sits at a 90 degree angle. So let's talk about breaking terms apart. You can use knowledge of the meaning of the parts to decipher the meaning of the term. When trying to define a term, begin with the suffix and work backwards. If the term also contains a prefix, define the suffix, then the prefix, and then the word root. So here are some examples. Nephro nephropathy, so nephropathy. So pathy means disease. The O, of course, is that combining uh, form. And the nephr, that's the word root meaning kidney. So the nephropathy is the disease of the kidney. Dysuria, so dysuria. So ia is the suffix meaning condition of. Dys is the prefix meaning difficult, painful, or abnormal. And ur is the root meaning urine. So dysuria is painful urination pain when urinating or difficulty urinating. Hyperemesis, so hyperemesis. Hyper, uh, that's a prefix meaning excessive, and emesis is the word root meaning vomiting. So hyperemesis is excessive vomiting. Next we have analgesic, so analgesic. So ic means pertaining to, an is without, and ings is, uh, means pain. So analgesic, pertaining to no pain. Okay, so medical abbreviations, acronyms, and symbols are a type of shorthand used for communication. It's developed because one um, could communicate faster using this method. It is important not to trade speed for accuracy. Use only commonly understood acronyms and abbreviations to minimize misinterpretations and errors. The Joint Commission and Institute for Safe Medication Practices are considered two authorities on abbreviations and provide do not use lists. So when you use an abbreviation, you pronounce each letter of the abbreviation separately and distinctly. For example, uh, EMT, you say EMT. When you use an acronym, you are shortening several words, usually using the first letter of each word to make the acronym. Acronyms can be pronounced as their own words. So, for example, sample, history is pronounced like the word sample. By reading the letters one by one, so EMS is pronounced EMS, or in a combination of the two. So DCAP, BTLS, right? So it's pronounced DCAP, BTLS. Misunderstanding and errors occur if someone involved in patient care does not understand the meaning of the abbreviations or acronyms. For this reason, some agencies limit the use of abbreviations. Abbreviations take place of words to shorten notes or documentation. Remember to only use standard accepted abbreviations to avoid confusion and errors. And be familiar with accepted use of abbreviations in your local jurisdiction or service area. Also symbols. Like abbreviation symbols are sometimes used as a shortcut in communication and documentation. As with abbreviations, it's important to use only symbols that are widely understood and accepted. So there is a master table, and the tables in the chapter provide a thorough reference of common word roots, combining forms, prefixes, suffixes, and abbreviations. Okay, so thank you for joining us tonight with Chapter 5 Medical Terminology Lecture, and we hope that you've enjoyed it. Thank you.